uh, like Shashank mentioned, we are basically building a technology called DeepSync. We are basically pioneering uh, a new branch of AI called synthetic media. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of content that is produced using AI that is virtually uh, indistinguishable from a human. And the reason for that we're doing is because, you know, today, look at what, so you, we, there are billions of internet users across the globe, you know, hundreds of languages, people listening to content, listening to seeing videos, et cetera. All the content you see on internet is produced manually. There are teams behind the screens who produce content. They record movies, they record podcasts, you know, they, they write text blogs, everything that you see online, this abundant content that you see uh, is all done manually. But this, this, this is just a scratching the surface. Um, in, the, in the next one decade or so, the content is going to explode dramatically thanks to AI, whereby we'll be able to produce most of the content using AI, which will be indistinguishable from the humans. This will not take over the job of a human. This will just assist them in many, many ways. Uh, and one part of that is what we're doing at DeepSync. We work in something called voice cloning, whereby we take a podcaster's voice, for example. The AI will learn to speak like a person. We will mimic how a person speaks. And then the person write a text message in the in our dashboard. And the audio will come out in the person's own voice. Uh, it will be extremely like, it will be spot on in accent, language, even expressions to some degree. And it can even speak your same voice in multiple languages. So Shashank can probably talk to you in, in French, Spanish in the coming future. Right. Uh, and this technology, if if works in the in the way we are envisioning it to work, would be the basis for metaverse, which is all about virtual reality at the end of the day. Right. Um, I started the company when I was 24 years old. I'm 20, 27 years old. Uh, we have raised a seed round uh, just last year in the process of raising uh, more capital to fuel the growth of the company. But yeah, that's just a gist of what we're trying to achieve. Um, our clients mostly work in online media uh, in, uh, in India and the US. That's just about what we're trying to do at DeepSync. Yeah. Mm, great. So, uh, Ishan, when you, how did you come across this idea? Yaar, ki aisa kuch karte hai, man. How did you stumble upon this? How did you identify the problem statement? How did you dig deeper to understand if it is a vi viable thing to chase? Right. So, uh, I mean, I'm not a problem first person, to be honest, right? I, I always, I'm, all on, I'm a technology first person. I like technology first. And then I think about how the technology can change uh, a particular way of work. So I came across uh, when it was early, when I was I think, three years ago, uh, there was a new library launched by Google called WaveNet, which was about creating a synthetic speech. It was very, very early. It was very bad at that time, but it was very early, but it gave me an idea that if we can do it for every creator in the world, Think about how much time we will save in producing content and think about how much content we can actually end up producing uh, by doing that. So rather than you're recording in a, in a studio, you can be in a beach in Goa, for example, and your audio will still produce in a high quality manner. You could talk to your audiences around the globe uh, without having the need to you know, learn multiple languages, speak in multiple formats. Uh, of course, that at that time, it was more of a B2C product. Right now, it's more towards enterprises. So we, we're building our APIs so a company can, you know, use their host voices for marketing, uh, promotional content, generating ads, for example, a uh, hundred thousand ads or a million ads on a yearly basis, which are personalized. So it will say, Hey, Shashank, maybe in a, in a Mitab's voice, for example, or Hey, Shan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's evolving into more of enterprise product right now. Yeah. But that's how it started with just a technology first curiosity, so to speak. Yeah. Hmm. So you mentioned about transitioning from a consumer first product to a business first yeah. product. Uh, when did you realize that it's time to uh, focus your attention on something very different? So it's not different. It's just that the, the, the rule of games are different from consumer to business. In business, you tend to make more money per ticket size, of course, and uh, you can build more dependency. Of course, uh, from the investor point of view, B2B is always attractive when you're building a deep technology, when you're building IP, because you can protect your IP uh, and you can scale that IP in multiple different ways in an organization's uh, sectors or the subsidiaries. So from that point of view, it was totally a decision of on business. Yeah. And uh, if you can throw some light on the possible use cases. So in, uh, when I, I'm wondering when you have the capability of converting someone's language from English to Hindi or Tamil or yeah. any other language, in that case is uh, movie houses, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, everybody would be running after you to get their hands on this technology. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the aim. So the aim is that we can take a take a let's say you watch Netflix, you can take an actor's voice and we can learn how an actor speaks, and then we can speak the same tonality in multiple languages seamlessly. 
right? It's the language part is still in research because 90% of what we do is hardcore research. We build our own technology because no one has done this before. There's no roadmap for us to follow. We cannot go internet and search for, you know, convert one to another language. There's nothing existing right now. So it's all built from scratch. That's why it takes time to build a deep tech startup. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the aim eventually that hope creators around the world, uh, influences around the world, companies with our BBC, for instance, uh, would be able to convert thousands of their host voices, assets, like we call them into AI voices and use that to produce content. Uh, synthetic media is not limited to voices also, also open towards video. So you'll be able to take a person's face and clone the face. For instance, you can create videos in a person's face for multiple different variations. Yeah. Yeah. Like someone mentioned, so Lata Mangeshka, again, we don't do that because, you know, we don't have the consent of Lata Mangeshka. She is no more with us, but technically speaking, that's all doable. Uh, yeah, but that, that comes in the bracket of, uh, synthetic media. Yeah. Uh, Sushant wants to know how long voice do you need? Matlab, how much of my voice footage do you need in order to create something very nice, seamless audio? Uh, so anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours of audio is fine. Uh, again, you know, it's not open to consumers right now, but as long as soon as it opens, you'll be, be the first one to know for sure, my friend. And uh, you, someone mentioned the word defects. So defects are the technology that works in a similar way, but it works without the consent of the user. So I can take Sushant's voice without his knowing and then use it. That's a deep fake. We don't do deep fake. We do, we do deep sync. We only take voice with the consent of the user. And there are many, many, uh, different security protocols that we have built that the person has to follow to be able to use our technology. So they have to record a consent. We do lip syncing with them. We do voice syncing with them. We do all these protocols to ensure it's you who is trying to clone the voice and not anyone else. Yeah. And you mentioned that uh, you're doing something which has not been done before. So when yeah. you encounter a problem, how do you go about solving it? Like a lot of us here don't understand research. So if you can uh, cite an example of a problem statement that you are trying to solve and then how you got through to that stage of solving it. Right. So research is uh, very simply put uh, brute force experimentation. Right. For example, in one month, we run 100 experiments. So we have, we have built our own GPU infrastructure. GPUs are just accelerated CPUs with multiple cores, right? And you have able to, you know, of course, play games with them, et cetera. But we run 100 experiments on a monthly basis, 95% fail. But we learn from every experiment what did not work and use that to improve the next experiment and so forth and so forth. Right. Of course, we can, as a company, we can only uh, allow, keep some chunk of our money into research. Most money goes into partnership and etc. But yeah, research forms a major part of what we're trying to do. And uh, when we say it's not been done, doesn't mean that it's not been done completely. There are research being done across the world in China, in Korea, in US on this technology. We of course take influences from these researches. We read papers, a lot of papers, but at the end we have built it ourselves because we need to make it production ready in technical lingo. So enterprises can use it without uh, hassle. It should be predictable. It should be always consistent. It should always be high quality, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's a technical question, but let's take it. How do you ensure that the modulation is picked up? Well, a lot of speech recognition yeah. softwares fail at that. Yeah. And so, so again, you know, uh, those who are familiar with AI would know that there are two kinds of AI systems we can build. One is called a supervised AI, where you tell the AI system to do something. And then there's something called unsupervised learning, where you let, let the AI run completely on the data set and you let the AI decide how to pick up things out of the data, data set. And it learns much more. So we use unsupervised learning to basically figure out the uh, accents or uh, emotions from a data set. So let's say I have 10 hours of audio, the AI will automatically figure out which of these voices, these voice samples are happy, sad, it will clusterize it automatically. And then we can use these clusters uh, to create emotional samples. So it is doable, it's still active research also, but yeah, that's how we make it work using something called unsupervised learning. Okay, and uh, Umesh wants to know what is the accuracy that you have? So if you measure it, how do you measure it? And what's the accuracy? Right. So, you know, guys, for, for this thing, you know, what we'll do is we'll, I'll send you a link probably at the end of the discussion. You can, it's a notion base that we built for multiple of our voice. You can just look at it whenever you have a chance, not a problem. Great. I think that would be nice. People here are starting to come up with creative ways to use and manifest deep sync in Diwali Cadbury launch ads using deep sync to convert their name 
Uh, and uh, the after you scan cannot, the QR cannot code, come into that for now. Uh, sorry, brother. Yeah. You you cannot comment, but I think that is a possibility out there. We can always talk about pos possibilities. Possibilities, there, right? definitely. Yes, definitely. No need for subtitles for Japanese anime with the same voice actors. Like the applications correct. are wonderful. Most of, uh, most of the people who joined are more on the are more web developers, correct? Yes, yes, or, aspiring developers. Okay, interesting, interesting. So, guys, you know, uh, again, you know, I don't have any agenda for this talk. I want to just touch upon two things, and then it's all about you. It's all your room. I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, how I see technology. Again, you are web developers, so uh, how web is evolving, for example, and how again web is just a start starting surface of a technology, right? Uh, if you are technology minded, then there are many, many uh, possible avenues you can go for, which are opening up uh, in this, de this decade. I mean, AI is one of them. Uh, one thing to note is that, of course, you know, there's an acronym called GRAIN, G R A I N. Uh, mm -hmm. It stands for uh, Genetic Engineering, uh, R stands for Robotics, AI stands for AI, N stands for Nanotechnology. So these, these four technologies are happening at the moment, and these technologies will be revolutionize everything you see around yourself. And all of this are open to anyone who is technical minded. So if you are, if you are keen in web development, your same skill sets can eventually apply to anything, which is information science. I mean, let's take an example here, right? Um, let's say genetic engineering. When I was in school, right? When we studied biology, biology was all about well, physical processes, right? But today biology is becoming information science. It's becoming something to do with data and then do with the physical process, right? And it's all, it's all about people like you who are actually building these systems. Uh, genetic engineering will change how we treat medicines. You know, it will change how we uh, treat diseases. Maybe one of you will eventually be working in research to treat cancer with information science. So using data analysis, etc. It all starts with curiosity of web, of course, because web gives you fundamental of coding. But yeah, that's the future you'll be aiming towards. Then of course there is AI, which we talked about. AI is also a, a very very big branch uh, with multiple processes going on. Then of course there is uh, robotics. I mean, I'm I'm sure many of you are all interested in robotics. Robotics is also information science, all about how you code, how you manipulate objects, how you manipulate systems to create uh, hyper realistic uh, Android robots, for example. And lastly is nanotechnology, which will also be used by technology folks like you to create nano scale or atomic scale uh, microcomputers. So these are four things that you should explore. You should read more about it. If you're interested in that, you know we can talk much about maybe personally. But yeah, these are four things where you can learn about which information science will actually apply towards. Yeah. Apart from AI, which we're talking about already. Yeah. Okay. I think Ishan, there are enough and more questions that have started coming please, in. Please, so yeah. if you want to start picking on any of these questions, by the way, in the audience, we also have some students from the data analytics courses here at Masai school. So it's a mix and match of web uh, aspiring uh, web developers and data scientists or analytics. Okay, so I there's a question: Will AI also be involved to development of web in the future? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, there is something called GANs, G-A-N, uh, generative adversarial networks, which are basically trying to model how uh, how human human work basically, right? So we use GANs for creating voices which sounds extremely like humans. There is a GAN-based coding technology evolving called uh, GitHub Pilot, Copilot, which will allow you to uh, learn how you code and it can code like you. It will assist you in coding, for instance, or be able to help you create web designs rapidly. So AI will be applied everywhere. AI is like electricity. It will be ubiquitous. It will be everywhere you can think of uh, in every sector, of course. Yeah. Then someone asked me that at what extent maths is required in AI ML? Uh, mathematics is one of the foundational things. So you need to understand mathematics. Not to not too much uh, to begin with. You can still use learn AI ML without too much mathematics. Just some uh, sim simple stuff which you learned in algebra or in your tenth class to begin with. But if you want to go into a master's or PhD, then mathematics is definitely required. Yeah. Yeah, linear algebra is much needed. Someone uh, mentioned that. Shank, also, if you have any, uh, you want to pick up any questions, uh, please do. Yeah. Right. Someone asked me, what is the future scope of data scientist? Um, imagine, imagine, you know, being a web developer when the internet was started. Okay. AI is like that. AI is just where internet was 20 years ago. It's early, but the future is extremely, extremely bright because AI as mentioned will be applied everywhere. 
web is not necessarily applied everywhere in every technology web will be applied everywhere from iot to industries to energy everything you can think of oil and gas even even the technology of going extinct ai will be everywhere electric cars uh like i mentioned you know even clothing uh, i know a startup who's using ai to you know increase the uh, efficiency of uh, producing clothing for instance so ai will be everywhere yeah let's one mention tesla yeah tesla is all software tesla is more software than is hardware so ai is foundation uh, data science is foundation for the future growth yes someone okay. asked that uh, how can we move from web development to ai um well it's it's a, it's a bit of a jump from web development to ai the concepts are a bit different but uh, it's always like a side hustle you should always keep learning some uh, small things uh, and you're trying to do there are plenty of courses online uh, you know which you can i think on courses or stuff like that there are many schools like masai school i think probably also gives ai courses but yeah you should start maybe doing some side hustle to learn ai concepts it's a difficult thing but yeah if you are interested you can probably pull it off yeah someone asked me what's the difference between web and blockchain development uh so very interesting question so uh web development is uh currently again this is just a very high level web development is currently more like a web 2 where everything is centralized blockchain comes under web 3 where everything becomes decentralized so there is no one party controlling everything but there are multiple parties where the information is divided to work of course bitcoin uses blockchain extremely heavily ethereum uses blockchain extremely heavily and if you're interested in you know in blockchain concept we can probably connect again but yeah blockchain also has a amazing future uh with given the rise of nfts and everything yeah okay uh, vikash has a very interesting question big challenge is the data set uh, for the projects that you are trying to do so how do you yeah. get or find voices that you can train and enhance your technology right. on so so vikash uh, you know today there is a lot of content available in text format you know you go to google everything is text today there is not so much data available in terms of multimedia so videos or uh, or voices which are in a structured manner ai always requires something structured to learn from at least to get higher accuracy so what we do to get data sets we either partner with companies like like for example big online media houses already have data recorded for them proprietary data and we sign ndas with them to get the data to train and we give them something in return we give them the solution in return for example right or what we do we build our data from scratch we get recording artists to uh, create data set for ourselves specifically for our training purposes but yeah that's a very good question data is a big big challenge today and there is no really way around it unless to build it yourself or partner with companies who already have data yeah that's a fast track way of doing that but uh, there are data sets like if if somebody is publicly posting their uh, voice is it not fair matlab just asking out of curiosity as you do you not have the option to use those and train your uh, i mean uh, we can uh, we can do it but we don't do it the reason for that is ethics right if you know if we start scraping data without the consent we become a defi company technically speaking right so we don't do that because we always want to have consent in the place that's just one of our policies of a company but yeah you can companies do that you know people or even regular uh, curious developers fetch up data from let's say of barack obama or some trump right and they create voices but they are not ethical means and as a company we cannot do that yeah hmm someone asked me that um how deep sync will help in producing a podcast what would be the advantages of anchor so for those who don't know anchor fm is just a recording app so you record something in it it helps you uh, publish it to spotify uh, etc deep sync doesn't require you to record anything you enter a text and it will convert your your text into your ai voice which will sound just like you so it it basically makes anchor irrelevant anchor still requires you to record manually deep sync doesn't require you to record manually you don't have to sit in a recording studio recording booth uh it all happens automatically just give it a command and a text and it will do your job for you yeah can you throw some light on the existing customers that you have and what kind of work they do in partnership with you right so we are currently working with publishing house online media companies uh who are in india and us and the major aim right now is number one to produce podcasts short form podcasts for them on daily basis so if they have a a uh, uh, financial weekly for example we can clone the voice of the host and create voice content every time every day without them need to be in the uh, in the office anything like that uh, we are also working on enterprises right now uh, where we will be creating 100000 or a million queries to create very personalized marketing campaigns so if you open up a app you will see your name being pronounced 
uh, with the advertisement, for example, with a marketing campaign, for instance, to increase the brand recall and to increase ROI for a, for a campaign or for a company as well, because hearing your name automatically triggers an emotional response in a good way, of course, right? It creates a more personal experience for you. So we are working with many, many use cases on that as well. Uh, of course, DeepSync also will apply to uh, other things like, you know, acquisition of users through email. So you can send a newsletter in a host voice uh, to be able to increase the brand recall again, or you can use push notifications in AI voice, et cetera, et cetera. So it applies in multiple use cases. Yeah. Someone asked mm -hmm. me, what step did you take to change your idea into action? Uh, so Kishan, that's a very brilliant question. I mean, Shishan can also throw light on that. So uh, idea is just that idea, to be honest, even though it sounds great, idea is relevant unless you're able to build an execution plan around that idea. Um, uh, the way we started was that, you know, when, when I, when I was working in my first job, uh, in, in Bangalore, I had the idea of doing this technology and it had the money to do that, of course. So I applied to accelerator program in Hong Kong called zero AI, who were kind enough to accept us. We were just two co-founders at that time. This was in 2019 and they gave us uh, $20,000 to, uh, as a pre-seed money, which comes before seed money to uh, launch our idea. And we were able to buy some GPUs with them to launch our idea. Then we were able to use that money, pre-seed money to get one or two clients to prove that our technology works in the real world. It's not just a, a, a fancy thing or something like that. It, it works in real life. And then we were able to raise a seed round uh, last year of uh, $300,000. So 2.25 crore rupees, uh, which gave us enough runway, enough money to hire people, hire researchers, to build this into enterprise grade company. We're now in the process of raising further capital to get more uh, people to join our company and increase our, so it, it's, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process. It doesn't always work, but yeah, that's the course we took. How did you find your co-founder? Like finding a co-founder, especially is tough yeah. and you're building a company that too in deep tech. So how did you go about uh, finding your co-founder, what were the things that you had to do to get it there? Right. So my first instinct of finding my co-founder, again, you know, I'm not a pro tech, I'm a technical person, but I'm not a technical person in terms of building an AI system, you know, infrastructure level guy, right? So my first instinct was to ask, uh, you know, ask my colleague in my previous startup to work with me. But the problem was that in startups, you have a clause where you cannot hire a person who's working with you for the next six months, once you quit the job. So I couldn't hire him technically speaking, even though I wanted to. So what I did was, which was the best thing that I did, I went to GitHub and I searched for repositories who are working on something similar, right? And I basically emailed or got in touch with every person in India uh, or probably around the globe who was working on this technology at that time. It was very early. And uh, one of them, uh, my co-founder now, Rishikesh, was kind enough to get on a call. And it was basically very uh, brilliant because we both wanted to do this thing. It was like a, like, you know, a match uh, happening out of nowhere. And he left his job. He was earning a lot of money at that time, but he left his job uh, to work on this idea. I left my job at that time and we started the company, but it was a, it was a big, big risk because I did not knew him personally. He don't knew me personally, but we took the risk nonetheless, uh, because we believed in the future of AI. We believed that something good is possible. Yeah. And, uh, it was just maybe part luck and part logic on reaching out to the people. Yeah. How many attempts, how many people had you spoken to before? Uh, you had Rishikesh come on board. With 15 to 20 you. people at minimum, I can remember. Uh, all of them rejected it. Reason being, some were either, you know, they, they already had a job, they don't want to leave, you know, they some had family. I don't blame them, of course, everyone has their own situation they are tied to. Uh, but, you know, that was a good thing because you have to be very, very risk oriented to do a startup. Uh, you should not have a family, at least. I mean, you can have family, that's great, but if you don't have family, uh, you know, family pressure at that time, it helps you in your favor because you can take bigger risks with your life. The best thing to do a startup is in you, in, in when you are 20, 30 years old, because you don't have a family pressure, you don't have, you're not married, you can take risks, you can try new things, you can probably build future oriented things. Uh, but yeah, uh, I've spoken many people, only one person was kind enough to accept my call and uh, uh, talk about it, yeah. I think this will be a story told multiple times later in the future. Someone um, asked me, uh, sir, please give me a brief intro for those who join late. I think Shishan can give give a give a proper brief interview for those who joined uh, just now. Um, okay, but although we should not be doing this because when we start uh, creating uh, the session is scheduled to be starting at five. However, uh, we have Ishan. He's the CEO, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, DeepSync Technology, an AI company that helps 
right now i think again i'll not be able to explain it well but uh, uh, deep sync as a company on the core allows you to clone your voice and then generate text a voice out of the text again yeah. i i did a messy job at explaining it that's pretty much it right so some someone asking me again i'm not sure where where exactly to take this uh, a webinar but someone asking me about how to pitch an investor about the idea uh, simple answer there is no right answer i mean uh, you keep pitching i mean uh, someone will someone will return your call someone will apply to you but you need to have some some conviction built either in your mind first of course and then as a traction so you either need to have some mvp some minimal viable product uh, or if you are maybe you know if you already have a background of running startups investors get thousands of deals on daily basis think about from their point of view they mm -hmm. only need to pick up a few people or few companies who they want to talk further so you need to be extremely extremely sure what you're pitching to them and you should think from their perspective will this pitch what i'm pitching the investor will it be attractive enough does have the confidence to be attractive pitch if not then you should not pitch at all because you're just wasting your time yeah okay now since i know ishan uh, uh, well uh, in terms of how his uh, job how his professional experience has panned out uh, ishan i want to know uh, when you started building deep sync you had a job and yeah. you juggled between your job and your startup before you went full time so yeah. how did you do what was the typical day look like for you and what advice will you give to our students who are building a project apart from what they are doing here so my see my best again you know uh, this is a question that really depends on your situation maybe some of you have financial means of having the time to spend on other things maybe some of you don't so it really depends on you know where you are in life right now how much time you can devote to something like that but approach that i took was that i was again i mentioned we i found a co-founder first to be able to uh, delegate the work that i could do myself because it's very important to delegate work when you're building a company you cannot do everything yourself although you have you might have the instinct to do everything you cannot that's a hard reality which people it takes time to learn that reality so have someone else with you uh, where you can delegate work um, and start small you know uh, don't think about you know building everything on day one it's not going to happen believe me you're going to fail very hard start very very small figure out the core elements that you want to start with if you're building a web application what is the smallest thing you can do to make a web application if you need users what is the smallest thing you can build to get users don't worry about building the whole aws infrastructure you know don't worry about google don't worry about that just a very simple thing you can use open source libraries you can use versal to deploy your app uh, and start small get conviction and then double down on those convictions see what works and leave what doesn't work and of course as you see conviction apply to accelerator programs accelerators are the best source to get pre seed money because they are very open to investing in young people they are very open to uh, risky adventures and they will invest anywhere between 10 to 50 lakhs for all that matters and you will get the money to get off the ground you can probably buy office space maybe a co-working space to start off and then you can devote your 24 hours to building that uh, position so start small uh, uh, apply to accelerator programs and have someone delegate the work to these are my three uh, three main points yeah but that's about building things i'm talking i'm trying to ask about uh, how did you balance your job and your side hustle because your students experience 996 which is again a very military style learning uh, yeah. curriculum so they start at 9 am their day typically ends about 11 12 o'clock and they could use some tips on you uh, from you on how you learn balance these two responsibilities well uh, during the 24 hours that you had short answer i did not uh, the problem with that is that you know there, there is i don't think there is anything like a like a work life balance when you're building a startup your work and life pretty much merge together there is no such thing you can actually keep it separate that's that to me is a myth right uh, but yeah i mean you should have as i mentioned you should have the capacity to see clearly you should be able to divide the work on a daily or a weekly manner, maybe some milestones that you want to achieve and achieve those milestones without, you know, worrying much about that. Uh, we did some sort of time management, uh, you know, to achieve that. But as I mentioned, uh, stars are very chaotic things when they're beginning. So there is no line you can draw uh, where you can, you know, keep the work separate, but yeah, uh, maybe have some to do's, maybe make some milestones and then achieve those milestones. That's the best form of management you can do at early stage. Yeah. Kapil wants to know uh, IBM voice AI versus deep sync AI. Right. So uh, very different. So IBM, uh, you mean IBM, right? So IBM, uh, we, again, we have done uh, a very, very, you know, core benchmarking on every technology. Deep sync beats every company by a wide margin when it comes to quality we're offering. Uh, what company like IBM do, they are, first of all, they're very, very risk averse. You know, they, they only work with use cases where they see they cannot go wrong. 
uh, with DeepSync is much more risk open. So we work with companies where experimentation. On the AI level, uh, I believe have the own libraries, we have our own libraries. So in that, uh, it's a whole different topic. But yeah, from the benchmarking perspective, DeepSync beats quality of other companies as of now. Yeah. Someone asked me, can DeepSync clone your voice in Hindi and convert in English? Uh, answer is yes. But in research, so we're currently making this live probably in the next one or two months where we can, uh, uh, it's coming, it's called speaker to speaker. It's not voice. It's called speaker to speaker technology where you can take one speaker and convert it to speaker two and convert the language. But yeah, that's very much a possibility. So which languages are you launching with? So we have uh, already launched Hindi. We're in the process of working with Span uh, with Spanish, uh, French, some more Western languages. Uh, and in India, we are going to add Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, basically every Indic languages that will be part of our uh, uh, our offerings. Yeah. Oh, crazy! So, so when you started, uh, just yeah. a question, follow up question on this. So when you started working on uh, embedding other languages into the picture, did you already have uh, customers in pipeline who are willing to pay for those things, yeah, or did yeah. you start first building and then it went on? So we already had interest. Uh, from the companies who wanted to use technology in Indic languages. Um, we already had the pipeline in place. We already had the roadmap in place. Of course, you need to have that when you're building this sort of a venture. But yeah, uh, we don't do anything unless there is a conviction from customer. Uh, it only just makes sense because we don't want to waste our time. Uh, even though it might be interesting, uh, we have to be business focused at the moment. Yeah. How much time did it take? Piyush is asking. So uh, that's a very, uh, I don't know, you mean in terms of building technology? Uh, it took us uh, one and a half year to build the technology, but if you're talking about the company, the company is now three years old. Again, much of the time was spent looking for capital, which was difficult because we didn't have a background to raise capital, but yeah, it could be fast tracked if you already have a background to raise capital. Did you ever think about getting somebody on board uh, who is responsible for raising capital and building that side of things while you focus on technology? So I was the one who was raising capital. I was the one who was pitching to investors. Uh, we didn't have the resources to hire someone full time uh, for doing that. But the best scenario when you're raising capital uh, is to the name of the game is called find the lead investor. Find an investor who will get other investors for you because that's how you save a lot of time. Uh, so your first priority when you're raising capital, this is for seed rounds, not for accelerator rounds, is to find someone who can trust you fully. Uh, he or she is called a lead investor. They will lead the round and they will be responsible for convincing other companies to invest in you. That saves a lot of time because you're not talking to 100 people, you're not talking to one or two people uh, to save the time. Yeah. So, are you choosy about investors? Because, from what uh, it seems uh, uh, as an external perspective, I think cap, uh, venture capitalists or investors would be after you that, hey, take my money, take my money. So, what is your process of getting somebody on board as an investor? Yeah, so we are very, very pragmatic in that. Like we choose, uh, again, uh, you don't always have you know, the right uh, opportunity to choose the right people, but when you have, you should uh, choose the right people. We look for three things. We look for number one, uh, their portfolio. We look for what companies they've invested in and what are the returns that they've got from the companies. Uh, like have they exited the companies? Have they raised further rounds? Have they helped companies to raise series B, series C, series D capital? Have the companies got to IPO? Number one, number two, the team of the VC firm, how well are they connected in the network? Do they have network in the U S market? Are they connected deeply into the, can introduce us to customers, can introduce us to potential clients, enterprises, stuff like that. Right. And number three is that, do they believe in the vision? What we're going for, do they really believe it? Or are they only after money? Because of course, money is a very big part of VC, but they should also believe on a personal level of what you're trying to achieve. So these three things matter a lot. And have you rejected investment offers because there was a mismatch in any of these three things that you mentioned? Uh, we, I would not say rejected, but we can say we uh, chose not to go ahead at that time. With them. Yeah. You, okay. We never say no to money, of course, but of course, uh, we always say that it's not the right time for that sort of investment. Someone is asking me very curious, I think three or four times that uh, AI and the future of humans, uh, were, it's just a very big topic, to be honest, uh, uh, Swapnil. So uh, in short, what I think is that, you know, see, um, if you want to go there, uh, someone is actually talk about that is that um, a, hu a human mind uh, has what a human mind has 100 billion neurons, uh, which we don't use fully, of course, you know, uh, but AI will have trillions and trillions of computing capacity. It will be able to in the next, next one decade at max, we'll be able to surpass the computing capacity of every human in the world. So over 8 billion people will be surpassed by the AI. 
now there will be two choices we'll have as humanity as species either we can let the ai take over everything and we become like a secondary species uh, for that or we can merge with ai and uh, still retain a number of position on 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 planet and be able to augment our 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 mind with ai uh, a company which is working in this direction is called neuralink by elon musk which is building uh, brain interfaces to connect with ai directly but yeah that's where the future is actually headed towards to merge with ai and not uh, get run over by it that would play a big game in metaverse is something that afan says and i agree with that when if ai merges with metaverse is uh, is just the it's a, it's, a, it's a successor of internet it's going to if change everything about the way you uh, interact and communicate with people of course the technologies are not yet in place you need hardware you need virtual reality you need computing resources to be able to create that virtual reality and you need synthetic media which what we are working on uh, and all them all have to come together to make it work it's still i think uh, 10 years away where the it, it is envision but yeah it's definitely was going to happen can metaverse fail anything can fail brother like for all i know my company can fail right there is no guarantee of anything uh, but yeah uh, we should be aiming for what is possible rather than what exactly works yeah. hmm okay okay uh, ishan how did you get into uh, writing code i mean when we met in college i think the first year of engineering you were not involved in coding at all no. so uh, let's go back a few years and try tracing how you started learning web development and how you got into coding right um so uh, so i was always interested in technology i was i already knew html when i was in 10th standard i, I built a website uh, by myself when i was in 10th to 11th standard it was not very good but it worked i was able to post it somewhere to make it work uh, but then when i came to college you know uh, we were taught c c++ etc and i had zero interest in all of that those things right i was interested in web at the time uh what we did at the time i think the best thing for me what worked out was that we were involved in a startup and the startup gave us the pressure to learn because we didn't have any, ha, had the resource or the idea to hire more people so it was all that i had to work on my or my uh, my friends had to work on uh to make it work so we learned web development uh, the practical way so to speak uh we were able to build a very awesome website i think you can still find them on archive somewhere uh, on the internet but yeah the website was eventually became so good in 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 aesthetics that the teacher who taught us did not believe it was built by us eventually it it got really really good right and it was all due to the fact that we were were in a in a good pressure to build the technology we learned it ourselves uh, our friends learned you know my one of my friends who had no experience in coding eventually learned to build android applications ios applications from scratch and that's a very very difficult thing to do when you have no experience prior but it was the pressure of practicality and to do something uh with within college we were able to build it up yeah you started with php yeah we started with php uh for the back end we used html css uh, and bootstrap i believe at the time uh but yeah of course technology have evolved today we use uh, for our technology we use react typescript for back end we use node js uh, golang uh, we use uh, aws arch- architecture we use lambda functionality etc etc but yeah that is when we started out your major in college my major was uh, computer science engineering yeah so did any of the things that you learned during engineering has any of it helped you in the current venture that you're building or the current life you're leading in most of my learning uh, actually happened outside the class so uh, i'll give you an example right so we had a entrepreneurship class uh, entrepreneurship uh, class in our college and the teacher was amazing i mean she was one of the first people to actually believe in us to be able to help us push it i think uh, at that time when we had a entrepreneurship exam i was actually building the business plan of our company at the back of the sheet of my of my exam paper and the teacher came in and she snatched the paper and instead of you know shouting or complaining to anyone she praised us that would actually taking advantage of what she's teaching us and not just you know cramming stuff so we had all these uh, small small things uh, small small nudges from uh, from teachers from fellow people but again uh, college was all about making friends uh, and to learn from each other and we learned a lot of uh, stuff from each other yeah so going back to the days when you were trying to learn web development and build yourself as a developer you went underwent a lot of right wrong things students here in the audience are also undergoing that phase so what are the things that you would advise these guys to focus on so that they emerge out 
or they can experience learning better or building better right so someone asked me this question very well someone asked me that can we join a startup after leaving the courses or whatever right startups are a learning machine guys whenever you get a chance work in a startup startup will teach you so much about hustling so much about building stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise i mean you can still learn things in a corporate environment but in a startup you have so many responsibilities and and startup ceos especially are very straight forward they are no bullshit people they'll tell you you're doing wrong and you have to understand that you're doing wrong there's no other way you cannot go away from that and startups are a good opportunity if you really get an opportunity to apply in a startup as a developer apply that learn that and you'll be able to you'll be thankful you learned it now in a startup uh, a word of caution it's very very um, uh pressure there's a lot of pressure you might have to work long hours someone when you maybe your ceo will call you at one at the night one am at night and tell you that your website is down and you'll have to fix it there's no other way there's no one else can do it so startups are good but it's only for those people who believe they can have the mental uh, endurance to uh, to work on it but yeah i would advise always opt for startups someone is asking me which language you use ai uh, so we we use uh, python mainly uh, for our ai uh which is the best language again we use many frameworks we use pytorch etc but python is the primary language we use for ai someone is asking me repeatedly how do you keep yourself mentally balanced um there is no one answer fit all uh i mean you know some some techniques that work for me i meditate so someone some reason maybe may work for you would be meditate yourself you know keep track of what you're trying to do have milestones have to do's for your weekly targets uh of course delegate work don't you know think that the everything is on your shoulders try to decentralize the work as much as possible uh but yeah keep a keep a fresh mind when you're trying to approach problems yeah but this is something that you have to do yourself this is something i can uh tell over a over a talk here yeah. okay deepak has been asking this many times so if you convert my voice in from english to hindi will i get to know about on it on email Uh, so deepak i think deep sync is not open for consumers like you and me right now yes, only enterprises uh, it's not at the moment yeah but we are planning to open it probably in the next 6 months or so deepak so uh, what you can do if you want to have that notification you can sign up on our platform uh, deepsync.co and once you go there you can just sign up on our platform and uh, someone will from our team reach out to you once and when we launch it for consumers but yeah thank you so much for that so ishan curious curious question while building deep sync have you ever thought ki yaar big giants like google amazon these guys may build something that i'm building on and make me irrelevant yeah so such thoughts yeah so that think that uh, thought crosses across my mind sort of you know every week or so uh, because you know these people see you understand one thing uh, big organizations have pros and cons big organizations have a lot of resources but they're extremely extremely slow moving and they're not risk open they will not risk on a technology which they believe is just a flimsy because they have long development cycles if you want to get one thing approval you have to go over a chain of 10 people probably more than that to get one thing approved in a startup someone can just come to me and tell me i want to implement that i'll say yes go and implement it it's very easy there is no chain of command uh, as much as that so in a in a company in a big organization there's a lot of friction but companies are good in implementing on a worldwide scale level companies have scalability which startups don't have right you might see examples like you know you might see companies like in india only there is company called zepto which is really zepto allows you to do a tenement delivery right so zomato can do the same thing but they can do it at a much higher scale because they have mm. process and they have the experience of running an organization so you can the, the risk capacity changes uh within a startup and organization yeah so from that perspective of course i hope that one day google would want to invest in us that's my always a, a open uh, conversation but getting beaten by them is always a possibility but uh, i mean that's who we are i mean we have to try our best okay people here are also curious about your transition from web to ai so how did you get into ai how did the process start how did you learn so uh, very simply i mean we we start that um, yeah we are not selling our startup uh, <laughs> ravi don't, don't mind we just talking about from the investment point of view right so uh, from web to ai i mean um, i learned something so i have i i read a lot of books about ai i uh, read a lot of books about the history of data science you know you need to know these things to be able to build these things uh, but as i mentioned uh, i am not a pro ai person i'm a technical person in the ai sense i have a co-founder and cto who works most on that part uh, we build the initial algorithm together but yeah he is the one who uh, works more on the core technical side of it yeah 
Okay. Nitesh wants to know any mistakes that you made in the age group of 21 to 23 that you would uh, not want these students to make here. All I did between 20 and 23 is make mistakes, man. Okay. And uh, that's all I did. I mean, uh, in a good way, I believe, right? So uh, uh, maybe, you know, I, I cannot really give you an advice here because uh, everyone has a different life experience, but uh, it's always good to have friends or I would call mentors who can guide you in some direction. Always have people, maybe senior than you, have someone, maybe friends who have different life experience to work together and try to absorb as much as possible from them. It's always good. I mean, rather than you just talking every day, let hear from people, uh, see what their viewpoints are. Other thing which worked for me was travel. Uh, it's not a conventional thing, but traveling helps you a lot. Once you travel somewhere or you travel alone or whatever, it gives you a perspective on life, which helps you build mental mental models, how to how to do multiple situations. There are many many things that can apply, but yeah, uh, mistakes. I don't really classify the mistakes as more than learning learning obstacles. And I think a few students have already asked this: How do we get to work with you in case there is an opening? So um, we don't have an opening right now. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. But you know, what you can do is uh, we have a LinkedIn page uh, and we regularly post jobs in that page. We will probably be opening up for interns in the AI and the web space in the next few months. So uh, please keep an eye on that and please apply to that. And you know, our team will be very happy to reach out to you and uh, get back to you. Guys, I'm sharing the LinkedIn handle of Ishan. So you can follow him there or you can check out DeepSync. LinkedIn page right from there. And I think that is something that you can do. So Ishan, uh, students here are very much, although they're here to learn a lot of times, they think if they will be able to make enough money uh, as a developer. So what kind of things do you have to say about the career potential that developers have in terms of earning? Although right. I know you are not a pro money person, but still this is something that's very important for the students. So no, man, I'm, I'm fully pro money person. I mean, making a lot of money is very important, guys. Like again, for personally or professionally. Uh, but um, uh, again, from the web perspective, as you already know, uh, web has matured, right? That's not a secret anymore. Web has matured. There are a lot of things already uh, are possible. But yes, if you're able to learn things, if you're able to build a differentiation, then there is money waiting for you. There's no concern about that, right? Startups are paying a lot of money for web developers. Uh, front-end development, back-end developer, uh, full-stack developers, for example. Of course, money is also happening. Uh, there's a lot more money to be made when you go behind the scenes, when you talk about data, data analysis, uh, uh, about data analysis, data science, for example, because that's where the talent crunch is currently there. In India, there, to be honest, there are not many people who even know what voice tooling is on technical level. They don't know what GANs are. They don't know what deep learning is on technical level. In India, there's a very, very big crunch and startups are willing to pay a lot and lot of money uh, to get talent who can understand these things. Uh, what's happening in India is that people are actually hiring from US and paying them more money uh, to be able to crack these things out. Uh, but you know, if, if people learn in India and they're able to build their skills in data science and uh, development, then there is money to be made, enough money to be made. And I think this data analytics students want to know more about what are the places where they can be plugged into the picture and how can they contribute. So if you can throw some light on data science as a career. So number one thing I would suggest for that again, it's again a big question, but number one thing I would suggest is that go to GitHub and search about these things, search about what's the work being done, uh, what the search is being done and read a lot about data, data analysis, data science. You know, data analysis can be applied in multiple use cases for business, for instance. You know, you can a company like Ola uses data analysis on a big degree. They use data to analyze uh, right patterns. Uh, uh, you know, insurance company uses data analysis to uh, analyze fraud patterns. You know, for in, for instance, so data analysis is everywhere, uh, from a small startup to a giant like Morgan Stanley, financial firms, for example, Wall Street, full of data analysis guys, right? So, uh, it's everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Ishan, uh, I think we are nearing the session and before closing in a few final questions, you have hired many people in your past or you've worked with other professionals. What other traits you or other recruiters look for when they're uh, looking to hire developers, especially entry stage developers or entry uh, level tech people as we have here in the audience? Number one thing that we look for is uh, clarity on trust principles. Mm -hmm. uh, does the developer know, let's say we ask them a question about, let's say, you know, react for instance do they know exactly how these things work on a very fundamental level and not on a superficial level unless they can answer those questions they don't even get past the first interview 
right? So one of our developers will ask them very, very fundamental questions about async or stuff like that. And they'll be very pinpoint answer. They want a very pinpoint unambiguous answer. And if the person can't answer it, we don't even go ahead because it gives us the impression that the person has not taken the time to understand the, the basis, the foundation of a uh, technology. You can still code, you can still make a website, you can still design it, but that will not be enough to scale as a, as a person in a, in a startup because startup requires you to understand foundational technologies, foundational things. Number one thing we know, look for is uh, clarity on first principles. Number two thing we look for is the professionalism of the, of a developer. You know, how professional are they in their professional life? And the, in, of course, how they work, uh, are they, uh, always, uh, you know, providing their code on time? Are they always professional in how they code, et cetera, et cetera. How are they in terms of communication with other developers, other team members, and all these things matter, uh, in terms of it, but yeah, number one thing, as I mentioned, clarity on first principles matter. Number three, what matters is experience. Of course, not more apply to a fresher, but you should always have some practical projects in hand for us to review very quickly, because please imagine we get thousands of uh, requests to uh, apply, right? And we need to sort out very quickly, which, which person will stand out for the next call. Right? So we the best thing we can do is look for open projects, either you have hosted somewhere or your uh, online portfolio, which gives us enough conviction that you're taking the time to present yourself in a manner that applies to professional life. And that will get, get you past the first call. Yeah. Could you throw some more light on first principles in terms of programming uh, and the audience here? First principles, a lot of people may not know what how to think in first principles or what first principles are for that matter. So for, for instance, so you take a you take a programming language, for instance, like, like taking example, for example, uh, uh, website development, right? Uh, you may know how to design a website, but let's say you have to build caching mechanisms. How does that work? How are you able to build caching mechanisms on the front end? All these things are matter because this, you, you understand that you understand the browser, how a browser works because you're hosting it on a browser. Do you know how a browser works? For instance, we'll ask you these questions. We'll ask you about memory. Uh, how does a browser manage the memory? All these things matter because you're trying to optimize a website for the end user experience. When I say that, you know, make the website optimized for mobile phone, you can design it from mobile phone, but it will actually work on a mobile phone at low network. That requires your understanding of a memory management, right? You don't have to be expert in it, but you should be able to, you should be open to those things. You should be knowing some degree on that part. Uh, and then of course, you know, when we ask about in AI, most people's first reaction in AI is that AI is just a, a big if else loop, you know, complicated if else. That's just not AI. AI is all about how it, how learning happens. So we ask them about uh, perceptrons. We go back to the history of AI. Do they know about these things? It's not that they should know everything about it, but they should have clarity of concepts how it works. Yeah. Okay. And let's close the final question with what is the revenue model of deep sync? How do you plan to make money and grow? Sure. So we are a SaaS company. SaaS stands for subscription as a service, which means companies pay us on a monthly or yearly basis, uh, depending on how much content they want to produce. So if you go to our website, uh, deep .co, you will see on the pricing page that we charge them hundred dollars on a monthly basis to produce five hours of audio, or we charge them $300 to produce 50 hours of audio instance, and they will pay us every, every month automatically to do so. This is, this is where we can predict, uh, what will, how much money we will make at the end of the year, how much money we will make at the end of five years, etc. Uh, we also have an API model, which we have not live yet, but it will be charged on per API call. So we'll be charging on per API call. So for instance, a company makes 100,000 API calls in one month and we'll just charge them how much, uh, quota they have. So it's a very simple, uh, SaaS based model. And have you started making revenue, generating revenue already? Yes, we've started generating revenue. Uh, although we're currently in the process of uh, closing some contracts with enterprises, post which uh, we believe the uh, the actual uh, the, the money the big money will kick in. I mean, you know, as a deep tech company, you're building a deep tech startup. It's more about getting the data, getting the processes right, than making money initially. You have venture capital for that, but you need to make money to prove the conviction, which we're in the process of doing so. Someone is asking what is your beta. I'll connect you with my CA man. You can ask him all you want. Okay. Okay. Any, any other closing notes before we conclude the discussion here, Ishan? Uh, yes, I don't have any questions guys, but you know, uh, like Shishan, I already given my LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to reach out to me, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I would be very happy to answer any questions you have and connect with you on that. I hope this session was helpful to you. Uh, I mean, we didn't have much time, but uh, I hope we covered a lot of ground here. 
I will quickly share your profile with them. Guys, you can connect with Ishan on LinkedIn. And if you want, you can share a picture of this as a memory on LinkedIn and tag Ishan. That is also something that you can do. Uh, Ishan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, guys, before you leave, uh, internally, we have a competition that we are announcing for you guys. But more about the competition, you will get to know uh, soon. So this is a competition where we invite you to share your tectonic shift story. So Ishan, we are doing a competition uh, for our students. We are also doing an event on the 23rd of April. And for that, we've thought, let, let's invite the students to come share their tectonic shift story. So for a tectonic shift story would be a moment where things changed for you and you went into another direction altogether. So Ishan, was there a moment which was your tectonic shift story where things started, things were very different and things changed for you for the better? Uh, yeah, it was not one moment, but a series of uh, series of patterns, series of thoughts. I was always interested in technology, uh, and I always believed that you know, whenever I got a chance, I would love to work on technology. But uh, when you know, in uh, in 2019, as I mentioned, a uh, opportunity presented us that they would fund us. Uh, I just took the opportunity without second thoughts. I left my job the same instant. My boss was super pissed off, but you know that was the the uh, the risk I had to take. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So guys, uh, we have prizes worth, I think, a lot of money, 1 lakh rupees. Uh, so more details about the competition will be shared. But if you're interested, you can submit this form and we will get in touch with you uh, with the details of the contest. Ishan, if you want, you can drop off. I just have a few other things. Sure, sure. Everyone, thank you so much. It was amazing speaking with you. Thank you so much. Have an have a amazing day. Yes.